Hi, everyone. Hi, Howard. Um, so I don't know if this man really needs an intro, because uh, you probably already know, but if not, you probably read the guidebook. Uh, but this is my good friend, Howard Phillips. Exactly. Thank you. So Howard, among other things, uh, was one of the, or, or, you know, employee number five at Nintendo of America. Yep. Mm. Um, and he uh, was there in various capacities uh, until, what, 1991. Yep. Uh, had a long career in video games past that that no one ever asks him about because it's not Nintendo. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, has done some really cool uh, experimental work. I mean, we actually met when you were doing a, a, a memory uh, game for the uh -huh. iPad to help uh, people learn to uh, memorize concepts. Uh, excuse me, I thought this panel was it too. <laughs> I ran here. Um, mm -hmm. Had a good deal going on the show floor. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, we'll go through a little bit of that, um, but uh, maybe more importantly for the, the sake of this panel, Howard is, uh, has agreed to work with us at a charity that I run. Uh, to help uh, document and preserve the history of video games. And uh, maybe a little bit specifically, uh, Howard has been helping us to kind of navigate the weird world of uh, breaking through the Nintendo Iron Curtain, maybe, <laughs> and, and figuring out how to make some of their material uh, safe and accessible to researchers. So, Howard, um, I think just to start off, uh, why don't you tell us how you got involved with Nintendo to start with? Is that interesting? Yeah. Okay. No, um, no one cares. <laughs> um, quick story. So Don James, who's still at Nintendo, which is ridiculous. Um, Don James was uh, one of my college buddies, and he had taken a job working for a small Japanese company in South Seattle who had opened a, a little warehouse, and they were importing arcade games, and they were importing the, the large size boxes. And Don was running the warehouse, and he was also helping them um, do the industrial designs for making cabinets in the US, making the press board cabinets. So all they would have to do is Im import the parts rather than importing all that air of the big cabinets to save shipping costs. And that was Don's job. But it started getting too big for him, so he asked me to come and help, as uh, just help out in the warehouse. And the second day I was there, it was pretty much clear to me that I was responsible for everything in the warehouse. So all of things coming and going, all of the shipping, um, unpacking everything and making sure it got to Mr. Arkauer, Ron Judy or Al Stone, um, or John Pedersen, who was the, uh, one other guy who was the service tech at the time who was servicing all the arcade games. And that was really my start, being a small company with the hyper growth that we had for Donkey Kong. We were, after Pac-Man, uh, Donkey Kong was the next biggest arcade game to hit, and then Miss Pac-Man. And for one, I think, four months, five months later, because of the tremendous success of Donkey Kong, um, I was 23-ish, 23 years old, and I was the largest volume shipper on the west coast of the United States. <laughs> Just <laughs> moving in Donkey Kong games that were being shipped over from, and parts that were being shipped from Japan, um, and then transshipping them to different distributors and locations within the U.S. And, and this I, was almost entirely Donkey Kong. Right, all of these yes, shipments. Yes, yeah. at that time it was all Donkey Kong. So, you, you, so Nintendo at that point had had a couple games, right? Like, not, not too many. Um, just getting started, uh, they'd done Sheriff, which was a light gun game with a really big screen, not a, not a great game. And, um, and then also Radar Scope. I don't know if you've seen Radar Scope. Which the, the, was the game famous for not being Donkey Kong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or not being Galaga or, yeah. or Galaga or, or Galaxian or, or Space Invaders. It, it was just another uh, screen shooter, but it, but it never really caught fire. It had wonky sounds and a weird attack beha behavior of the, right. of the things. So you were a game player at this point, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so were you hired to, well, you weren't hired for this, but you eventually sort of became the internal, at least a start, evaluator of what's good and what's bad video game wise, right? Yeah, so imagine you're the warehouse manager and shipping manager for a company that's got four other people besides you in it, and you're getting boxes of stuff from the parent company in Japan, 
And so I'd open them all up and find out what was inside. And sometimes it was Game & Watches. Other times it was new PC boards for um, a prototype um, arcade game. And if, depending on what it was, I would either just play it myself and, or set it up, or I'd get John Pedersen to help me plug it into a game so that we could then test it out, make sure it ran well, but also play it, right? And then tell Mr. Arakow or Ron Judy or Al Stone that you know the new game had arrived and they could come play it if they wanted to. So I got to not just handle everything, but also play everything just as part of the making sure it was ready and available for anybody else in the, in the you know, small group of us who wanted to play it as well. So um, maybe my memory is failing me, but I think Nintendo had a home console around this time. No. <laughs> Maybe three not yet. or so. Not yet. You're rushing me. You're rushing me. <laughs> no. so, so with the arcades, you asked, it, you know, did I help out providing feedback or evaluating? So with the arcades, also we had a small route, a test route, where um, we'd have our own machines like Radar Scope or Donkey Kong or Sky Skipper or Popeye or other, or other games that we would test to see if they were earning good money. And then I'd make minor changes to the dip switch on the PC board to change the amount of time that you'd have per quarter if it, you know, the timer would start at two minutes or start at uh, three minutes or the number of lives you've had. And I'd make adjustments on those to see if I could maximize the quarter drop. Um, so I had a pickup truck that was the company's that I'd put the games in the back of and then drive to the 7-Eleven or the tavern or the arcade and pull the game out of the back and run it inside and set it up. And then also I'd hang out and, and talk to the other players who were there at the arcade or at the mini market and, and our competitors' games would be out there as well. And so I got to you know, see how those games were dealing and say, ask other players what they thought of the games, what was cool. And <clears throat> excuse me, of course, as a player myself, I was interested in um, <coughs> Excuse me. I was very interested in new games and, and good games, and if something sucked, I was just happy to you know talk to other players about why it sucked, etc. <laughs> and then I'd go back, and Mr. Arakawa would say, "Well, what do you think?" And I was just always very. Um, he was very. Mr. Arakawa is a very approachable guy. He listens well, so he just sits there and he asks you a question, and then he goes. <laughs> and you you feel obligated to fill the 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 silence with your own voice. And so I'd you know, tell them what I thought just and what other players were thinking. And that became a formal, it became an informal role for me and then became a very formal role for me. So if we get in a new game and watch, Mr. Arakawa would say, what do you think, is it fun? Or we get in a new arcade game or a new prototype for something and he'd say, well, you know, how, is this a good game? Um, there was, a, he'd ask Ron, Judy, and Al Stone, and Don, et cetera, but, that became kind of my primary activity in addition to just doing all the shipping. So when you're waiting for a truck to come in, you're playing games. Or when you get, a, when you get something in um, a new box and everybody's away at lunch, then you play it before they get back to, to lunch. Just as a quick aside, um, you mentioned Skyskipper. Yeah. Uh, kind of an obscurity in, in Nintendo history that, uh, as far as we know, was, that, when it was never mass distributed in the US. Do you remember it not testing well? Um, it was not a great game. True. <laughs> um, it, was, it was unusual. I mean, so to be a great game, um, a lot of people have to like how it feels and like how it plays and, and, and be successful at, at learning to get good at it. And Skyskipper had a couple things that made it uh, less approachable and not quite as fun. The airplane kind of putted along a little bit slow for the ADD and all of us, and and the loop to loop was a little bit out of control, and and it wasn't didn't really have a punchy pickup when you when you picked up things. So it just didn't compare to the experience that you get when you play some of the other games, our competitor games, and and also Donkey Kong. So was it? Uh like your analysis of that game that, that ultimately stopped it from being distributed? Or was there more of a... I mean, it was a collective effort, right? right. But, but I... The, Why, I why'd you kill this game out? <laughs> <laughs> so um, it, there, was never a, there was never a point where it was Howard Says, yeah. and therefore the yeah, company yeah. does. Never. It was always a collective kind of feeling about what was going to be successful or not. And for me, I both had my own sensibilities just being a player, but also I spent a lot of time 
trying to tune in to other players and really listen to what they liked or disliked about games or what they hoped for out of their game experiences, and then just talking to Arakawa or Miyamoto or whoever about that so that they'd have a better understanding of the, of the North American market. And whereas the Jap at the time, the Japanese arcade market was very, um, very energized, and there was lots of Japanese developers, Taito, Namco, um, uh, uh, Capcom, um, et cetera, that were all making great arcade games, and they were, and so they had good designers and 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 development staff that was very sensitive to what it took to make a good game but they didn't necessarily have a good sense for what were some of the subtle difference be differences between the expectations for North American players versus um, Japanese players, where that was the biggest arcade market at the time. And so I kind of helped give voice to that and give voice to all the gamers in the room about what it was that we maybe liked or disliked about some of the games that were being developed back then, primarily in Japan. Um, at, at that time, early 80s in Nintendo, there was next to no uh, developers of arcade games in the U.S. compared to the kind of very vibrant arcade development in, in uh, Japan. Right, it was basically Atari, Valley Midway, is that it? Well, Valley Midway yeah. was, was the exception in, in the U.S., yeah. yeah. Um, if you're no longer feeling rushed. Mm -hmm. I'm not rushed. <laughs> Can you breathe now? <laughs> Um, so part of your job, we'll, we'll rephrase this question. Uh, so part of your job was basically opening the mail. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, and, uh, but it was like Christmas every day. Because <laughs> <laughs> sometimes you'd open it and it'd be, you know, like a power supply, big deal, or you'd open it and it'd be who knows what. But more than half of the time, it was some new, some new product, some new version of a product, again, like a Game & Watch or... or um, in 1983, you know, opened up and there's a Famicom, which I didn't read Japanese, so I had no idea what was coming. We're small companies, so it's not like we'd sit down and have planning meetings and say, this is coming next week. We had hyper growth, so it was really like, how do we deal with all the orders from last week, not how do we deal with what's coming in from the parent company, Nintendo Company Limited, in, in uh, Kyoto. We didn't even, at least I never really had visibility looking forward, so it was always just you know, surprise and Christmas when I'd get some cryptic bill of lading in, in Japanese and then I'd open the box and there was some cool, fun, new game to play. Like a Famicom. <laughs> like a Famicom. <laughs> so, um, so you opened that up and, and I, I, was it sent specifically in 83 from the parent company to say like, hey, do you guys think you can sell this in the US? Was it for evaluation? Um, Yes. Okay. I mean, everything was that. Nintendo Company Limited was generating a lot of different products yeah. of, of games, different types of games. Well, yeah, they were still doing toys and everything, too. Were you guys getting those as well? Yeah, yeah. That is, so, we'd that is get all this, so we'd get all this stuff, and we'd, you know, we'd, in the Game & Watches, we might get you know, 15 of them when we were only going to eventually sell 5 or 10 of them. Um, but we'd get all the... All the um, esoteric ones, the ones that particularly, including ones that were very focused on the Japanese market. At the time, like with Famicom, got Mahjong, and you know, I learned a little bit how to play Mahjong, not by playing the rules, but trying to just move pieces around on the screen and reverse engineer what the rules of the game were. Um, <laughs> reverse engineered Mahjong. <laughs> so, I mean, video game market at this point, in the U.S., is, it's just it's just flat, right? Because well, when you say video, so the, the do we home, have to say the home console okay, market. So we have to say arcade game <laughs> yes, and video yes, game, yes. and video game does not mean arcade game. Is that right? Okay, let's you, let's draw this you. distinction, everyone, right now. So, <laughs> uh, so are you, are you asking me is is, a, is an arcade game a video game for the sake of discussion? For the sake of discussion, right now, uh, we'll define a, a a game played inside of an arcade cabinet as an arcade game. Okay, great. And then a console game as a as a home box that's a console, it's not what, a computer. What happened to video games? I thought we used that. We, well, you were confused, no, you so were I wanted to eliminate... Game, video game, and I think of video games include arcade games. Well, anyway, <laughs> console games, which for this moment we will call, for the sake of this discussion, and Frank will call video games exclusively. Console games, um, there was a question about them. <laughs> the question was... 
was the home console market, uh, the home console market in 1983 when you're getting the Famicom in. It's yeah. pretty flat in the U.S. because of what we now was, call the was, video game it crash. It was dead. It was dead. It was dead. Um, so <laughs> there's sort of this, like, uh, do we like this creatively and do we like this as a product uh, uh, argument that I imagine might be happening internally as you're evaluating this system that's playing, like, basically arcade Donkey Kong at home? So I was... 23 years old and I didn't know anything about business or marketing. I just was a player right. and I liked the physical work of working in the warehouse and you know, moving 181 containers of games in a single day. That was fun for me. You know, whether something would make, uh, make uh, a good business or not, I had no clue about that and it didn't even cross my mind. For me it was all really just a focus on is this fun to play or not. Um, at the time in the early 80s um, just to kind of set the stage, you could go into a, uh, a tavern or into an arcade and you could play pinball games and you can play a couple novelty games like the hoop games and, and skee-ball and things like that. And then we started seeing some arcade games and they were, they were for a while novelties to themselves. You'd go into one of these um, locations and there'd be pool tables and skee-ball games and, and a lot of pinballs and then an occasionally a, a, an arcade game. And then the arcade game started getting uh, successful with some cool games, uh, Space Invaders, Asteroids, uh, et cetera. And in that context, all the excitement around video games, mm -hmm. I'm gonna confuse you now. Oh, okay, well, all the wait, excitement what's a video around, game? Wait, okay. <laughs> we all, have the this. all the excitement around electronic games was really in the arcade. Electronic games? When, when, I know, I know. Is that game Sorry, watch? Hang, <laughs> just, just roll with me for a minute here. So the, um, at when the, when the uh, uh, home systems came out, in television, Odyssey, um, uh, Atari 2600, it was really cool because you could play these great novel mm. new arcade games, you could actually play it at home and you didn't have to put in a quarter. Awesome, very cool. But the games were really shitty. I mean, the little teeny, teeny, teeny graphics, you know, and you hit the, the five star, it looked like the five on a dice was the, the guy in the baseball, was the guy at the plate, right? And then he had an extra dot for the bat and that would swing, you know. And, and the game would just fart at you instead of making yeah, sounds. So, so yeah. it was fun to play at home just because you could play it at home and you didn't have to spend money, but it was nothing like the arcades. And, and the Atari 2600 was phenomenal for hardware that you could do something that you could play at home on your own TV but it was nothing compared to what you could do in the arcades. Yeah. So, when I opened the box in 1983 and it had the Famicom and it looked like this little weird cords this short on the, on the controller's thing, and I plugged it in and I played Donkey Kong on it and it was the exact same game as in the arcade. It was like a, just a, a head explode moment and there was all these other cartridges in the box as well. And most of them were just weird, wonky games. But it was super cool that now with the Famicom, you could play games that were exactly like the ones that were in the arcade. And that was just, just amazing. Yeah. Um, I imagine some of you guys are going to have questions, maybe, eventually. Oh, no questions. OK, so we can take our time. Um, <laughs> I'm going to jump ahead a little bit, just for the sake of time. Um, you evaluate the system in 83, uh, I mean the company does, uh, you kind of come to the conclusion that uh, we probably can't sell this thing right now because no one's buying video games store-wise. No, absolutely, that wasn't yeah. me at all. I, yeah. I was going like, holy yeah. shit, let's sell, sell this Kong thing. Everybody's going to love this. Yeah. this. Mr. Arakawa, this is awesome, this is so cool. Look, Donkey Kong, it's the same, it's awesome, let's get it, let's But he's play. like, no, we can't sell this, no one's going to buy and it. He, and Mr. Arakawa, he's, <laughs> there's a couple signature things that he, um, he does in conversation and one of them is to go, hmm. <laughs> well, does he have which a slight usually, variant that's the good one? Which really means, I hear what you're saying, but no. Um, and, and obviously, you know, in, in retrospect, I realized he was familiar with what was going on with the, um, with the consumer marketplace and with, with uh, home video games. And he didn't bother to go into some MBA discussion of why or what was going on. Or, or he just said, hmm. Um, so it, it, we, 
And then for the next year and a half, we kept, I kept opening boxes with even more Famicom games and cool games, you know, Kung Fu games, and it was just an uh, F1. Super Mario Brothers. Not yet, not yet. <laughs> but anyway, it was super awesome. So I was saying, re I, I just every chance I got, I, I would yeah. say we really got to do this. And at the same time, we were getting, again, more, um, more arcade games um, were showing up. And I started to think that we weren't, really going to go anywhere as a company because, you know, here we get Popeye as the next thing. Yeah. And at the same time, the other Japanese arcade manufacturers were making pretty cool games were starting to come out and that were very playable, very fun. And the games that we were getting on the, on the um, Famicom were neat, but they were typically like a year late yeah. at that point. Um, like 1942, Commando, et cetera. And so I was thinking, oh, this isn't going anywhere fast. Oh, nice. I, I, yeah, I, then, I never even considered that. Yeah. And then Arakawa said, you know, I, we're going to test launch this. And, you know, Mr. Arakawa and Ron Judy and Al Stone, who are really just arcade salesmen, um, Howard Lincoln would come into the office, but only as uh, he was working as uh, for a law firm. Um, he wasn't actually in the, on the company yet, in the company. And... Then Arakawa said, "We're gonna, we're gonna try this. We're gonna do a test market in in uh, New York, New Jersey area." And of course, I was super excited about that. Didn't think at all about the fact that we'd have to move back there. We wouldn't hire somebody to replace my um, to take my responsibilities in in um, in Seattle over. So I had to manage both warehouses, and then also go out and do all the promotion and set up all the. Um, the display demos in the store. Tell people and how to use the do, stupid robot. And then also, I ended up getting cajoled into doing all of the um, uh, the lifestyle press for it. Right. So, you know, the cameras and interviews and radio and all that stuff. So we all know the story is very sadly they never released the Nintendo Entertainment System. <laughs> <laughs> the test market yeah, failed, failed spectacularly. Uh, no, of course it comes out and um, wildly, well, not immediately wildly successful, but Boom! Right, like it's yeah. it, it it becomes you know it, it becomes the system that grandma just calls video games. Right, this is a Nintendo. Yeah. Um, okay. So so stop. So that's where it got interesting. <laughs> that's where it got really interesting. I'm and out. that's and that's oh hang on a second. Stick I can't moderate me. Howard. Stick Phillips. with me for a second. That's where it got really interesting for me personally because our um, our product flow had been pretty slow. Um, meaning that I'd wait, you know, a couple months before I got something that was dramatically different from the thing that I'd got in the box two months earlier. And then all of a sudden we started getting this flood of, of um, Famicom games from Japan that I was asked to evaluate for um, being licensees for Nintendo for the North American market. And on an in, both on a licensee basis as well as on an individual game basis. And suddenly there was new games almost every day. And the, for me, one of the reasons I'm here now uh, and one of the reasons I'm sitting next to you is I'm a big supporter of the Video Game um, History Foundation. And I thought about this, why is it that I even care about this stuff anymore? <laughs> and it's, it's because it just like the first day of the show, I walked down the arcade aisle. And I looked at each game as I'm walking and go, oh yeah, that game, Dig Dug, you know, that game, that game, Atari Deluxe, on and on, and I'm, or Atari, Asteroids Deluxe, and I'm going down the row and I'm, think, and I'm just reliving that experience of what it was like when I saw some cool new creative thing or some cool new tech in, in a game form. And it's, it's really great. You know, we see a lot of repetitive dramedies, movies, things, it's pretty much just another, another version of the same thing again and again. But back then, with the hyper-acceleration of technology and creativity that was going on in the home systems, we were seeing all this new stuff come out. Like, every six months, it'd be something that you'd just go, wow, this is so cool. And I was on the front of the fire hose of all of that stuff coming out of our licensees, out of Mr. Miyamoto and R&D R and um, R&D four and three and one and two, and then also um, um, getting all the stuff from the new uh, US and European uh, developers and licensees. 
And it wasn't just game creative stuff that was being developed, it was technology. We were having new MMC chips, eventually had you know, the graphics chips, et cetera. But it was just super cool. And by going back and picking up a piece of retro software or looking at uh, reading some, um, some article that was written about you know, a new release, et cetera, for me, I get to relive that, that discovery and that fun, cool new thing. And the Video Game History Foundation is all about that. It's all about capturing all that detail so that all of us, and including kids who aren't in the room now, who, are, who missed it all, get a chance to kind of experience that excitement of, you know, here's this cool new thing. Can you believe it's Castlevania and his chain goes out that far? It's like, <laughs> whack, whack. It's you so, really whacked me. I mean. <laughs> You know, it was so cool, you know, and then, then there's Ninja Gaiden and he can climb walls, he can spring off walls, you know, it just, all of that stuff was just so cool because it was that, after living in a time where you didn't have a big long chain to whack somebody with, or you couldn't spring off walls and you suddenly you could, or you had a character who was only this big and then suddenly with MMC chips we could have larger characters on screen, I mean, just all of, and battery backup, don't get me started, it's so cool. So. I'm hoping that, um, that uh, our effort through the Video Game History Foundation, which is uh, sourcing and cataloging and digitizing and, and to the best of our ability eventually sharing all of the artifacts that we can pull together, which means both games and, and development um, materials, source code, whatever, that, that we can get that with the goal, from, from my goal is so that any of you can experience that on, um, on your own through accessing the, um, the materials or that future generations can also experience that. It's kind of like going back to the, to the Wright brothers and watching them crash 20 times in a row and then they finally figure it out and they make the wing a little bit longer this way and they move the engine a little bit further back and then suddenly the thing doesn't quite crash. It's thrilling and exciting to relive those moments. And that's what I hope we can all do with the Video Game History Foundation. That's a great analogy, too, because a lot of what we... Uh, thank you for selling me better than I can, by the way. Um, <laughs> that's a great analogy, the, the, the Wright Brothers thing, because um, a lot of what we focus on is trying to preserve uh, how these things were made, right? Like, how, why decisions were made, uh, you know, in regards to, like, what actually shipped in the games. Um, you know, like you mentioned source code, for example. Uh, if we have access to that original source code, we can see the equivalent of the engine in the wrong place, perhaps. Like if we have, you know, commented sure. out code, things like that, and we, we can sort of understand a little bit better uh, why it is that, that uh, these games are so meaningful for us by sort of exploring them, uh, not only in that sort of deep level, but also, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, going around and sort of remembering how things were by, 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 by seeing them. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm semi-interested in that, but I'm more interested in people uh, sort of experiencing these old things through the eyes of people who are there. You know what I mean? Sort of contextualizing things so that when a kid sees Xevious or something, you know, they're just going to say, oh, spaceship game, right? But, but if they understand uh, the context that uh, around Xevious at the time, the way that someone like Howard does, and this is, you know, part of the reason why I like to get Howard on the microphone in front of people is to... Uh, you know, you, you sort of understand these games in a more meaningful way if you understand what they were as opposed to what they are. And, and uh, I think that's a, a huge, huge part of why we're collecting all of these, what I call, uh, contemporary materials so that we're not capturing just the games, but like what they were and what they meant to people and how people played them and how people thought about them at the time, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Hey, questions? Yeah, we got 10 minutes. You do the pointer. <laughs> okay, I'm the pointer. Uh, the first one I saw was first row here. Yes. Uh, why did you say no to Tom Kalinske and working for Sega after you left Nintendo? Um, so I didn't know, say no to Tom Kalinske. Um, I said no to Shinobu Toyota. Um, uh, game over, just like um, oh, uh, console game over. wars is, you know, there's a, there's a, theme of fictionalized writing going on with re fictional, fictionalized novelization of, of history. And <clears throat> what you've read is, if you've read either of those books, is not accurate. Um, the story <clears throat> of, of 
uh, Sega and I is I was looking to get out of Nintendo. I'd been there for 10 years. I was being used more for PR than for production, even though I was the producer for, for the Rare games at the time and, and was um, moving in w to do work with more of the uh, second party developers. I was finding I wasn't getting the time that I wanted to do that because I was um, being asked to go on the road with the Tour de Fun geeky name, things like that. Um, and Sega had approached me, not Kalinsky, but uh, uh, Shinobu Toyota, and said, you know, we'd, would you like to work with us? And, and I'd say, well, let's talk. And um, we had negotiations, one salary and stuff like that, kids in school, tuition, college tuition. And he, um, he was, he's a great guy, very, um, I liked him personally. Um, I hadn't met Kalinsky um, personally. And I said, well, I think this can work. Um, they had, they wanted to use me for PR, for the PR coup of having Nintendo's person who was responsible for, in part, for the, the perception of quality of uh, the games was now gonna work for Sega and they just released their, um, uh, their master system was out, and they just released the Genesis, and so it was going to be a big coup for them. And I said, yeah, but the reason I'm, I'm leaving Nintendo, looking to leave Nintendo, is I want to um, have more of a career in the production and creation of, of games than, than the PR stuff is allowing me to do now. And he said, okay, well, we, we can do that, and we negotiated to have a certain budget for doing titles. All was good until... Um, I had some time to think about it. And unfortunately, Shinobu Toyota got on a plane and flew up to do a handshake with me in Seattle at the Edgewater Hotel. And, oh, no. and, and I tried to call, I, I didn't try, I called his secretary that morning and said, listen, I'm having second thoughts. I really, I, re I, I don't think he should um, come up on the plane, but I'd love to talk to him on the phone now. And she said, well, he's already left for the airport. So that was one of the most uncomfortable, embarrassing, unprofessional parts of my career was having to walk into the, um, to the lobby of the hotel and sit down with him and look him in the eye and, and tell him, I'm sorry, but I just can't do this. And it was because I perceived that, that um, Sega would really want me first and foremost for a P PR role, and that's just not what I chose to do with my career. Oh, uh, God, there's so many at the same time. Uh, the middle, here, yes. Yes. Hi, Heidi. I'm going to repeat the question just really quick. The question was the Howard and Nestor comics in Nintendo Power Magazine uh, were mostly produced in Japan, on, on, especially on the art side. And the question was, Howard, did you have any uh, involvement in, in the, on the creative end of, of the Howard and Nestor strip? Was that a fair retelling of the question? Yeah. Yeah, so um, Gail and I, Gail Tilden, um, who is the editor-in-chief, and I was a co-editor, but really Gail took care of all the the business aspects, but not a not a gamer, and so I really um, was the other leg of the stool, two-legged stool that um, that uh, was responsible for all of the game stuff, all the accuracy um, uh, with regard to any any of the information in the magazine. And we would go and have editorial uh, discussions about what was um, what should go in the magazine, the next magazine that was going to come out. And that was based in part on the game ratings. We had our own internal evaluation system. There was a group of myself plus two others, the big three. There was the, the six game counselors, the GC6. And there was the unwashed masses, masses of the customer service um, department. And we get, Whoa. and they, well, there was like, 100 to 200 evaluations would come out of them. And based on all of that, we'd get a, a general sense for the relative strengths or appeal of different games that were, that were upcoming. 
And, and then also, just from a designer perspective, um, we'd make some, some assessment of what we thought was the, um, the stronger games to do full coverage in. Howard Nestor was part of that. So rather than, than do all big maps and things like that, Howard Nestor's role was really to get in front of the most common questions that would clog up the customer service lines. I mean, really, it was, it, and it was the, you know, the Nestor shtick was I knew that, because you'd always run into people who'd get stuck, and they wouldn't want help, and you'd start to try and give them a little bit of guidance, and then they'd, they'd say, I've tried that, I've tried that, I've, you know, do this, and so Nestor was the, was the reluctant player who, it was all of you, who we would say, <laughs> Well, you know, you might just want to check everywhere in that first level, or you know, you don't always need to just run to the right on the screen. You know, there's other directions you can run, and get people to discover on their own the things that were that that the designer was using to kind of trick them or make the game more interesting. The actual content themselves of how they created the you know the fun of it and the banter between the characters, a lot of that came out of the Japanese staff. We worked with a very small group called Workhouse, and there was like four people, five people, who did all of the uh, pre-production production on the actual content. And then Tokuma was the um, publishing company, and they had the printer. So they they do all of the, you know, where, when are we going to print it, how are we going to print it, all of that stuff. But the actual production was just a really small group of, of people who were, who, um, or employees of Workhouse is the name of the organization that was in, in Japan. And we'd get together with them once a month. I'd go over um, for a week and a half or so um, once a month and sit down with them and go over the proofs for the current Power Magazine as well as talk about editorial and their stories, their story ideas that you have pencil sketches for the, you know, the next uh, Howard and Nestor. Okay. Uh, you were first. Yes. Uh, the question was, what is your experience with Super Mario Brothers 2? I imagine you're asking about the Japanese version when you, yeah. Uh, Japanese one? Um, it was, f from my perspective, not a, not a particularly fun game. It was a very challenging game. Um, you know, it's like if you put a stick in your eye and you say, well, it's, <laughs> you know, can I, can I bear this? Um, there was just a couple, you know, the, the, the falls that you would have that were unpredictable, so basically the designer stealing a life away from you without foretelling, without giving you any tools to anticipate what was going to kill you. Um, you know, poison mushrooms, less fun. Uh, more of the same game design with not a lot of, of novelty um, to kind of offset that, that, those additional downsides to it. And um, it just didn't get the attention of the, the Miyamoto love. It was done by one of his, his um, associates um, primarily, and, and Miyamoto was working uh, mainly on Metroid and, and starting work on Zelda at that time, and just didn't devote enough of his energy to the kind of goodness of the game. And I think, it, for me, it was really the first example of where Miyamoto was being spread too thin. I mean, if, I think he's a, a tremendous designer, but just because you're a tremendous designer or an amazing painter doesn't mean every painting you paint is going to be you know, a wonderful, pleasing painting. Most of his paintings are very pleasing, but he made a couple that were not, and also when he handed the brush to somebody else and let them paint, it wasn't necessarily that good either. So, was that a... Them. Sorry, I was going to ask, was that a big three consensus on, on that game? Or were, were you evaluating at that time? Yes, I'm thinking about um, the big three. So my recollection, and I'll have, I could check, my recollection <laughs> is that, um, that uh, Mr. Oden and Don, who were the other two people on the big three, that they, um, they liked it a little bit better than I did. Yeah. And I, I think um, because I was, I was really seeing everything all the time, I became brand agnostic. I didn't care if it was a Nintendo game or if it was a, a Tecmo game or an Acclaim game. I just played it for the game. So the fact that it was Super Mario Brothers, I was really excited. Here's a great new Super Ma Mario Brothers game, Poison Mushroom, oh fuck. <laughs> you know, it, so, so um, I was kind of very early. Arakawa was 
curious. Um, I think he had a little bit of foretelling out of out of Nintendo Japan that it, there was that it was maybe a little controversial, but I was just there was no question in my mind that it sucked compared to <laughs> my expectations. Right. Right. Now again, later on, as a, as a history piece to play it very fun and interesting, yeah. right? Interesting to kind of figure it out and what made this particularly challenging, et cetera. But in the context of there's other awesome great games coming out, um, you know, Ninja Gaiden, Castlevania, all these awesome games, and then here's this thing that just wasn't as exciting. So I was, I made that um, kind of strong statements very early and consistently to Mr. Arakawa. Um So I think we're out of time. Is no. that correct? <laughs> So, uh, okay, we are out of time, which I think is what that means. Um, okay, he, he just, five <laughs> more questions. <laughs> um, I just wanted to make a point really quick that, um, I, don't, I don't know if you caught Howard say, I could check, because um, one of the things that Howard is helping us out with, uh, and by us I mean the world, really, is um, digging through your paperwork, right? Okay, like, stop, yeah, back, yeah. back off. Um, so, <laughs> so, <laughs> Frank's doing stuff and pursuing um, individuals and uh, phys getting physical things, development kits, games, et cetera. Um, he's also talking to uh, magazine publishers and um, getting their archive materials. I'm helping, um, trying to con reach out to old developers and old publishers who, have, who are actually there, who ha might have materials, et cetera. But there is another, there is a third leg of the stool and that's all of you and your friends, and your, maybe you precisely, or maybe it's your, uh, a relative, your uncle, or something like that, or aunt, who, who worked in the industry, or, or had captured something out of the industry, um, more than just another, ver another cart. So if you happen to have you know, communication, correspondence with, with uh, customer service people, or you know somebody who ran a store back then, and like me, they have a basement full of stuff, that they go through periodically but haven't been through yet. If you can help us collectively bring that stuff forward, and we don't necessarily want to have the physical thing, we want a digital facsimile of it so that that can be used to expand our kind of capture of and archiving of all this stuff so that then we can share it with each other and you know next generation of video game players. And tell better stories. Is that good? Yes, that okay, was amazing. Good. So. <laughs> You Thank can you, be Howard. Part of this. <laughs> um, what are you up to right now? Um, are we supposed to go like next door or something? Well, I was kind of thinking we can go to the uh, museum, maybe stand next to the oh, donation box, the and uh, <laughs> just hang out and see what happens. I don't know. We need a box where people can drop material. We do. It's a money. very large yeah. box. Yeah. Uh, so you want to go down there? Yeah. So uh, we will be in the museum, which is D135, It's almost directly below that. us, kind yeah. of. It's and directly below that guy in the back there with the ponytail thing. And uh, <laughs> if you haven't been down there yet, please do. Even if you don't want to talk to this guy, come see the exhibit we set up. Thanks, everyone. Thanks very much.